There we go. Okay. Um, I'm Dr. Bly, and uh, we'll take first we'll take a look at the syllabus, and you'll see I've got uh, phone numbers on the left. That's my office phone in uh, Beckley, and my cell phone. So what's the best way to use those numbers? If you want to call my office phone, I might be there and I might not. But don't worry. If you wait and leave a message, our system converts everything into a voice file, something that they can send to my email. So I'll get your message pretty quick because my cell phone is synchronized with all my email accounts. Uh, if you want to contact me by cell, best way to do that is with texting. But at least for the first text that you send me, be sure you put your name and what class you're in. And then from then on, the text messages, they, they sort of, they grouped. So they follow. So if I see a text message down here and you don't put your name in it, all I have to do is scroll up to the top and see, oh yeah, that's who that came from. Like if you're not going to be here, let me know. If there's an illness, if you have any kind of questions, that don't take a lot of uh, thumb action to answer. Uh, if you need to talk to me on the phone, then try that number. You could try my cell. But the problem with cell phone, with well, actually with any phone, is jump calls. So if I don't recognize the number, or it's not in my call list and has a name attached to it, uh, I may not answer it the first time, but you can also leave a message if you want to call voice myself, and I'll get back to you. I usually, if, I, if a number comes through that I don't recognize, I'll check it. I right? this little app, see if there's any complaints about that number before I block it. I don't want to block your number. Okay. Um, uh, the next is my email address. My location is in, in Beckley, so I don't know. Does anybody live between here and Beckley? No. So it'd be a pretty long drive. It takes me a couple of hours to get here in the morning, especially now for working on the roads between uh, Pineville and here. I've got those lights, those stop lights for, to direct one way traffic. That's about 20 minutes to the drive. But the roads need to be fixed, so I can't complain too bad. Those are my office hours. And this this document with all the nice colors on it, this shows you where I am. Of course, first four days of the week, I'm in Beckley, or Raleigh County. And I'm only here for this one day. But if you know in advance that you need uh, that you need assistance of any kind, um, let me know. I'm usually here an hour before class starts. And I can stay late if you know the problem you're having and you need some tutoring. Uh, okay, so let's get to the, uh, uh, the course delivery is traditional, which means that basically 100% of it is delivered face-to-face. But they allow a little wiggle room, zero to twenty-four percent via uh, online services, which for us is Blackboard. Um, but basically, what I do is I give you lots of handouts. So you may get sick of that. But everything I give you in class is duplicated in Blackboard. So if I give you something in class and you can't find it later, you can always go to Blackboard. And print out another copy. Or if you come to class next week and realize you still don't have it, I might have an extra copy. Okay, so we're going to be meeting for a couple of hours in the morning for lecture and then a couple more hours after that up until about one o'clock in the lab. Um, and most days we will have uh, lab activities. Some days we don't. 
And for those days where we don't have lab activities, um, what may happen is we'll bleed over lecture into the lab hour, especially if we're behind with the makeup of it. But for this class, um, none of the labs require formal reports. Have you ever done a formal report in a science class? No, that's okay. That's not the main thrust of this course anyway. In my general chemistry classes where I have two semesters to do the, the work, the labs that go with those, I have them do formal reports. And it's a good skill to have that you don't to go a certain direction. But for these, I give you the hand, I give you the labs of hard copy uh, the week before so you can study them. And then you just fill out the information on the hard copy. Um, perhaps maybe uh, an extra page, like a, a graph. You might have to draw an extra turn. Uh, we'll talk more about the labs later. Let's not uh, digress too far on that. Okay. Textbooks. Everybody have uh, Stoker's General Organic and Biological Chemistry? Okay. You can probably get by with their earlier edition. Since the edition wasn't hurt, you can find a used copy real cheap. The uh, lab manual. The reason I have you buy the lab manual, even though I hand you hard copies, is that so I don't violate copyright. If you pay for it, they're probably not going to bother us about, about my making copies and modifying it a little bit and handing it out. So uh, I, it might be difficult to resell it since it's a custom print, but maybe if you know somebody that's going to take this course after you, you can sell it to them. Uh, it's probably not something that you can you know, like go on. Uh, see, where do you sell stuff? Facebook has it. Way to sell them. What's that other one? I can't remember that. Because I don't use them. <clears throat> but there's the potential for reselling them to get some of your money back. Um, okay. Other things that you're going to need you're going to need a calculator, a standalone calculator, not one that's in your phone app. Well, now, cell phones these days are way too smart. So you can look like you're playing your calculator when you're actually looking up answers. I've had people do that before. So you've got to get a calculator. $10, $15 pops. You can get a scientific calculator at Walmart or wherever. If it says scientific on the package, it'll do everything you need. I keep a spare one here. Because you might walk out the door and forget your calculator. I have one. Actually, I have two, but you don't want to use this one. My personal calculator um, doesn't work like normal calculators. Anybody have any siblings or relatives in uh, sciences or engineering? No. Okay, I had one student. His brother was uh, engineering school. She understood exactly what I meant when I said I have an RPM calculator. RPM stands for reverse polis notation. Instead of saying one plus one equals, you say one enter, one plus, get your answer. The advantage to that is that you don't have to use parentheses everywhere. Uh, okay, so learn how to use that calculator. If you don't already know, look for the functions. Functions like doing powers, uh, entering scientific notation, um, going into setup and telling it how to give you answers. Like in scientific notation, um, how many numbers followed by times 10 to the power. Uh, learn how to use the logs and the anti-log. Everybody? Oh, that's a good question. Anybody had algebra? Okay, so you know logs. You know how logs are constructed. What log means. <coughs> if you say log of uh, 
x equals y. And this, of course, is going to be base 10. Okay? What that means is 10 to that power is equal to x. Okay? This is the log. This is the anti-log. Okay? So if you take the anti-log, you look at the log key and do a, a second or function key. And usually 10 to the x is right above it on the keypad. So there'll be more of that when we actually need it. Okay, so learn how to use your calculator. Um, in this class, we probably are not going to be using a natural log. So if there's a key in there that says LN rather than LOG, that's the natural log. And I don't think this class uses that at all. The common log, base 10, you know, do just fine. Um, okay. Other supplemental materials. Okay. We'll talk about the other things when, no, I guess we better do it now. <laughs> Need a lab coat. One that goes down to your knee, like that. If you already work in the healthcare industry and you have access to some of those uh, disposables, some of my students do have disposables. As long as you're covered, that's fine. You can bring one of those, and you can use it until it tears or if it's you have a spill on it or something, you throw it away and get another one. But if you need a lab coat, um, a lot of my students, I don't know around here if they. They have uh, uh, smock stores somewhere close. Otherwise, you can go online and usually get one pretty quick. Uh, the rest of the stuff, um, like uh, <laughs> we have uh, eye protection in the lab. The problem with that is it's been used over and over again. It's got scratches. So scratches on your glasses bother you. Smudges bother you. You may want to invest in a, a pair of goggles your own, of your own. Uh, gloves, uh, disposable gloves, we supply those. You won't need them for every exercise, but when you do, they'll be available. Initially, we're gonna we're gonna do a couple of exercises where we're actually not gonna use any hazardous materials, so you won't need gloves the first couple of times. Uh, of course, objectives, we have to put that in there. Specific. Actually, a specific goals. That's, that's way too much information, I think. Now, everybody's burning question. How do I grade? Okay. We'll have um, four exams. And those together comprise 60% of your grade. And then all the lab reports that you turn in, average those together, and that will make 40% of the grade. So like seven. Um, and what I'll do is in Blackboard, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, you can go into Blackboard and My Grades, look under My Grades, and I'll post uh, exam grades there. Even though I grade them and hand them back to you, I'll post them there. And then after we get an exam and maybe a couple of labs, I'll start putting uh, running course average. So you keep track of where you stand in the class. And you can check the calculations yourself. And if you have a question, ask me, and I'll, I'll check it to be sure I didn't make a mistake. And then I'll explain again how grades develop. OK. <clears throat> and the, the letter grades are a 10 point scale. So you get 90 or better, you got an A. Uh, like I mentioned before, when we when I give you an exam, um, I try to structure the exam so I can grade it quick. It's got lots of multiple choice. Most of it's multiple choice. So I can get it graded fast and back to you uh, before you leave class that day. So you don't have to wait till next week to find out or, or read it in Blackboard, but wonder why you got that grade, you'll have the, the graded copy written. And then you can check it 
and see if I uh, checked one wrong, say, you go back and see in your notes or you can work it out again and uh, ask the question, did I make a mistake or did the you know, instructor make a mistake? If you think I made a mistake, just, just mark it and bring it to me and I'll check it again. I'll be more interested to see. Mostly because I'm going fast. I'm trying to. And it happens. Um, and occasionally I make a mistake on a key, a graded key. So if you come back to me, you're actually helping me check my key to be sure it's right. Okay, so on this page, um, I have a course calendar. This is what we're going to be doing every day. Uh, in the course, and uh, barring any interruptions like snow days, um, we'll stick to this schedule. So you'll see um, days and dates on the left hand side. I put um, notable dates in here that you need to keep track of, like uh, Monday the 16th of March. Those are when mid semester grades are due to the records office. That's when I have to turn them in. So everything up to that point will average into that grade. And if you're missing any assignments, at that point, I average them as zero. But if you turn them in after that, then they replace that zero and, and the average continues towards the end of the course. Of course, if you got anything missing at the end, you know, there's no recovery from that. Spring break is identified here. For us, spring break is the 20th of March. Uh, let's see. Last day to withdraw with the value. That's good to know. I mean, I, I hope everybody's doing fine by that time. But if circumstances beyond your control have interfered with your performance in the class and you think you might need to withdraw, that's the last thing you can do it without getting a letter grade. And the last day, uh, 18th of May, is when the grades are due to the registrar. So, Final exam is on the 15th, and then I'll turn the grades in on the following Monday. You should know what your grade is by then. Uh, what I'll do is I'll grade exam four and put it into my spreadsheet, and it'll calculate your, your final average, and then I can put that on that last exam too, so you'll know both of them. Okay, you can interrupt me with questions. Uh, let's see. Okay. Attendance. Let's see. Attendance. The school has a policy and I have a policy. They allow excused attendance. Excused absence, excuse me. Um, it, it's really immaterial to me in this class because I don't count attendance as a grading component. So, you look it up You can always access the, the video. Um, I'd advise you to show up right? because you can't make up the labs. You can make up work in here. That's easy enough. But the labs, you got to be here. Do the labs. Uh, unless you've got a willing lab partner, if your lab partner shows up and does the work and, and gathers the, the data, um, not, the, not the answers, but the raw numbers, and you can use those raw numbers if your partner's willing uh, to complete the report if you have to be absent for uh, the lab. What I want to see is when you answer the questions, the calculation should be fairly close. Um, unless uh, one group uh, makes a measurement and it's slightly different than another group, then the answer should be a little bit different. But they all be all of them will be close or within a certain range. Uh, but when there are discussion questions that need to be answered, um, I can tell pretty quick if you plagiarize from somebody, copy somebody's answer. Okay, um, let's see. Nobody in here is uh, a significant other or living together. Y'all 
loners. Okay, for the time being. Okay, good. Uh, the reason I ask that is I've, I've had a couple of classes, one in particular that comes to mind. I had a married couple that was in my chemistry class, and uh, they were lab partners. It was pretty obvious when they turned in their lab reports. I mean, they were verbatim copies of each other. And since I didn't put it in my syllabus ahead of time, you know, certain things that, I mean, this is basically a contract. Since it's not in the contract, um, I had to make accommodation for that. Of course, I graded them harder than everybody else. Uh, okay, let's see. Everybody knows how to be considerate of others during an exam. You've got control of your nervous tics right? so you don't aggravate other people with tapping them. Definitely don't you go. Those popping comes is just cringeworthy. Um, cheating's not too common for me. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm always aware, you know, but um, the very few times that it's happened, I generally don't take you to. Uh, anybody higher up and, and plot charges or dismiss you from the class. What I like to do is, is keep things in house. So if I have a, a very strong suspicion, I mean, I, I, I look for, for proper evidence and indicators, you know, I'm not going to charge you falsely. Uh, but if I suspect cheating on one exam, the next exam is going to be a doozy. Yeah. I'll, I'll, everybody gets tested on the same material, same chapters we covered, but you might get a special test on that same material. Right? That's not to frighten anyone, right? I mean, I'm going to be fair, and all you have to do is study the material, learn it, do your own work, and you'll be fine. Uh, let's see. Okay, we'll go to Blackboard in just a minute. I want to be sure all this other stuff, inclement weather. Is everybody on the uh, alert system? So that you'll know when uh, school is closed. Not likely, but you know, it could happen. The worst weather I ever saw in West Virginia was in the first week of March. I mean, snow was up to here. I just come back from Atlanta gone down there for a trip, come back to Atlanta. It was just starting to snow. And within a couple of hours, it's up to you. We had a small child. We needed milk in the house, and we'd been away for a while. And I had to walk a half a mile to the store in that weather <clears throat> to take care of business. Um, but most of the time, I think, actually, this has been a pretty mild winter so far. You know, natives, everybody here born and raised in West Virginia? OK, so I'm an outsider. I grew up in the South where you get a snowflake maybe once every 10 years. And usually, at least in Atlanta, most of the time you don't get snow, you get ice. So it's either good weather, rainy weather, but rarely snow. Uh, okay. All right, so um, uh, before I forget, uh, there's a, uh, a back sheet here to show that you received the uh, syllabus. It's just uh, print your name, assign it, date it. And then add a number there where it says phone number suitable for texting. If you put uh, a number there that can receive text, which usually means a cell phone, then if I'm delayed for some reason, you know, if there's a traffic accident out there and I get delayed, or if I run off into the ditch, go in a snowbank or something. I can text everybody and let you know that I'm either going to be late or I'm not going to be here. That's what that's for. So you can just tear them off and pass them down to the end. I'll pick them up.
Blackboard yet? Everybody's taking a look. Okay, we'll do a quick run through. Just make some highlights. Come on, wakey wakey. Here we go. Uh, I don't remember which computer I'm at. So there's the front. There's the first page. Now, it's been eight months since I was here last. They, they changed the look, right? So I had to re, refine everything. And on this computer, I, um, I don't have my, uh, I don't have a direct link up here at the top. Right? So I got to go to an online class. That's probably it. There we go. It remembers me. Okay, so there's Blackboard. Eventually. And let's see. Yours won't look exactly like this because it's got all this other garbage in it. There's the course. And now what I'll do is switch to uh, student preview. This is what you'll see. Okay. You come in. Oh. Um, let's see. Can we narrow that down? Uh, what's the focus? Let's see. Let's zoom. I need to zoom it back out. No, that's not it. That's not it. That's no help. Is there a zoom key here? Can you do it electronically? Zoom. Not gonna let us do it. All right. Wi Fi. Let me do this. That won't help. All right. Use your imagination. On this left hand side, there are two important links. One is start here. Start here, got the welcome message and all that stuff. But, but we've got a, a folder for the link. Uh, for the syllabus and my schedule and then some other garbage that they insist that we put in here. Then at the bottom you can either you can go link to the next step which is uh, should be course modules. And that's about it. Uh, learning modules. Here we go. Oh does everybody have a copy of Microsoft Office? Okay. Because right, you can get one here for free. All you need is a valid email address. So link to learning modules is right here. It's also available over here on the left, learning modules. This is where our business is. Um, each exam has um, a folder and underneath that is uh, a folder with the PowerPoints. I'll hand out PowerPoints for each chapter. Now, these PowerPoints are derived from a different text, so they won't look like your textbook. But in the schedule, so that you know where to find the information, what I've got is um, <coughs> about the fourth column over, lecture chapters. These are the chapters in your textbook that pertain to the discussion that day. Um, all right, so you can get the PowerPoints there, and they're um, whatever chapters we're covering, in this case, chapters one, two, and three, 
and they come in three different flavors. They come in PowerPoint, right? So if you have Microsoft Office, just call it that one, and you can replay the PowerPoint yourself. Uh, if you're not where you can use a PowerPoint to display them, they're converted to a PDF file. So you, all you need is Acrobat Reader. You can look at them there. Uh, you, you just don't get the, the videos. If there are any embedded videos, they don't show up on the PDF. So I created a different one, HTML5, which is the language for browsers. Right? So if you click on that one, it'll come up in your browser like that. Oh, wait a minute, I did use yours. Okay. I'm already trying to confuse you. Okay. I did, in your case, I did use the PowerPoints from, from uh, Stoker's text. Okay. If you were taking general chemistry, that last comment would be valid, but not the one. Okay, so these are the chapters that we cover and the sections. <laughs> Uh, and then you just click through them. You know, if there are any embedded videos, they'll play. Okay. All right. So that's that's how your PowerPoints look. And you got breadcrumbs up here at the top, so you can back out like that. Um, I'm going to give you this handout in just a minute. Know these element symbols. Right. So that shows you the elements that I want you to memorize the symbols for. You don't have to memorize the whole periodic table. Just these. These are the important ones. The ones that are in, in red outline and pink background. Okay. I got a couple down here at the bottom. Uranium and plutonium. They're there for uh, social significance. Because they, they were uh, individually responsible for the destruction of two Japanese cities at the end of World War I. Two. Uranium for little boy and plutonium for fat man. Anyway, I'll hand you out a hard copy of that. This one is extra credit. I'll hand you that one too. Okay, this one comes up slightly different. Um, and the reason it does is you have access to the file here lose it, or if you mess it up and you want to start over again, you can print out another copy. Um, and then if you want to submit it, you can submit it hard copy in the class. Right? It's, it's due um, for exam one, same day as exam one. Or since midnight's the deadline, you can, you can drop it here. Um, you can attach the file, your work. Once you do your work, and you have to take a picture of it or scan it. Then you can drop it here, uh, just browse my computer, and submit it. Right, so I'll get it then. And that's worth, um, there are two extra credits for this chapter, this uh, first exam. One is um, the periodic table that you fill out. Uh, the other one is. Oh, the second one comes for exam two, so you don't have to bother with that one right now. But both of those extra credits together are half an exam break. So you can build in a little buffer in your, in your final grade with these extra credits. And the whole point is to give you practice and to help drill some of this stuff in. Okay, um, so that was extra credit. Let's see what else. That's it. That one. Now, what else do you, are you responsible for? Well, there is homework, but I don't grade it. Seems like a waste of time, doesn't it? Believe me, if you do the homework, it will help you on the exam. So. Uh, I've got a handout for that, plus it's right here, it shows you, uh, for exam one, chapter one, two, and three, those are the problems. Right. Seems like a lot, but some of them are just knocking out quick. Um, 
and then um, laboratory exercises. Every laboratory exercise is here. And you can turn in your laboratory exercises the way, same way as the extra credit. You just have to photograph it or um, scan it. And then you can uh, actually, sometimes if you call up the uh, PDF, I think, let me see if I'm correct. There's one of the first ones. Yes, okay. You can't fill it out in your browser. You've got to download it and then load it into your uh, Acrobat Reader. So let me see if that works. Open it. Well, don't tell me they don't have one of those up there. Okay. So let's open it with the Reader and just see if it works. Okay, there it is in your reader, and let me see. Come on. There we go. There we go. See those blue things? You can fill those in. Right, so you can you can put stuff in. Should be able to save it. So you go up here. Not let me save it. There it is. As long as you can save your work like that, then you can submit it. The only thing that you, you can't put in here easily is, is drawings. But you should be able to, uh, to do it that way, and then you don't have to scan it. You can just submit that. That's an alternative way. Like we finish the lab. You don't have to turn it in at the end of the lab period. You can take it home. It's not due until the next time we show up in lab. Most of the time, that's one week, the next week. Sometimes we skip a week, so then you have two weeks to finish. So that's my rule. If you, all labs are due. Uh, the next time we walk into the lab to do it, the next lab. Then the, the last one is due that day. OK. So let me get out of this. No, we don't need to save that. We need that. So there are all your lab exercises available for uh, reprinting if you need it. Uh, if you want to complete them that way rather than hard copy, it's fine. Okay. So what else do we need in black? Um, oh, here's a, <coughs> your Southern West Virginia email. This link will allow you to send emails to anybody in your class without having to look through the whole school roster to find somebody's name. The only names in here are just your class members. So I use this a lot. If I need to broadcast a message to everybody, I'll just send it to all users. And you can send in the emails from here to anybody. You can't receive them here. You have to go into your, your uh, email account to receive messages. Uh, but you can send them from here. And that brings up another point. I advise you to um, check your, your school email once a day. At least once a day. I mean, if you're compulsive, you can check as many times as you want. <laughs> but once a day for sure, in case I send a message that is important. Because I generally don't send messages that are not important. Okay. So, any questions so far? The rest of this stuff, <clears throat> they make me put it in there. I think the... the, the The protocol that's sweeping the nation now is called QM, Quality Matters. Anybody heard of that? It's, it's guidance for, it started out as guidance for developing 
uh, purely online courses. And it's branched out to hybrid courses and now it influences our in-state classes too. But um, in my experience, QM is just, it's a mess. You need somebody, if you're going to use it and their uh, protocol, you need somebody that's trained that knows how to not make it so messy. So, uh, but I'm sort of stuck with this design. That's why I pointed out these two places, uh, actually three. There's your email, there's your start here for your syllabus and some other things, and there's your learning modules. Those are the only three that you really need. Because I don't use groups, we don't do chat sessions. No, that's for the social sciences and for non-science courses. And some, I got one, one instructor that likes to use it for anatomy and physiology. That's okay, that's her choice. But I don't use it. Um, so that's Blackboard. And everything is in there. Now, uh, let's exit this. And everybody know where your email is? We won't go over that thing. So now, <clears throat> what I want to do is hand out some other stuff that you're going to need. It's over here. So it's off camera. Um, let's see. Yeah, we need those. Let's take one, pass it around. This is the first chapter, PowerPoints. I give you hard copy PowerPoints, so you can scribble on them if you want. Uh, they're as much for me as they are for you. PowerPoints keep me from wandering too much, which I have a tendency to do. Um, this is your extra credit for um, filling out your periodic table. Okay. And this is a hard copy of homework. So this, you can use that to guide you through the homework. What we'll do is, <clears throat> um, I built into the schedule uh, days for review. Yeah, the, the Friday, the week before, that Friday will be spent on nothing but review for the material that's gonna be covered on the email. So what you do is, Bring in your uh, homework problems, the ones you worked and you feel comfortable with, fine. Um, anything, any one of the problems that are giving you trouble, um, and you can talk to me about it any time, but this definitely on the review day, we will go through those problems uh, that, that are giving you trouble and work them on the board and iron out our problems so the next week you'll hopefully be more comfortable with the material. Of course, if you don't give me anything to do, I'll just stand up here and talk some more. <laughs> I'm not above that. That's not focus. Okay. Good morning. Okay. Everybody got three handouts so far, besides the ones you got at the beginning of class. So I guess total you have uh, five handouts at this point. Okay. Um, oh, you do need this one. This one shows you the symbols that you need to memorize. Now, um, that copy only has the symbol. It doesn't have the name for the, for the element. So you have to look that up, and you can find that in, uh, let's see, no, not on that one. You have to look it up in your, in your book, your textbook. Most chemistry textbooks have two versions. They have a, a periodic table, and they also have an alphabetical list, usually under the front cover somewhere. And you can look down and match the symbol to the name. And that'll give you your brain a little extra work 
you know. Um, it's a funny thing about uh, memory. We really remember the stuff for most people. You know, if you're blessed with photographic memory or cursed as the case may be. Um, memorization is strongest when you struggle. You know, I, I can remember stuff back in high school. But really the stuff that, I, that sticks out in my mind are the questions that I missed on exams. From then on, I don't forget them. Like one of them, the answer was Blitzkrieg. Everybody knows that, the, the German uh, tactic of uh, massing tanks and, and uh, airplanes and bombers and just overwhelming the enemy, just like that, that's Blitzkrieg. I never forgot it after that. Missed it on a test, nothing more. So if you struggle with something, um, you're more likely to remember it. Oh, another example. Uh, my best friend and I took organic chemistry together as undergraduates. Uh, he took, there were three, it was on a quarter system, right? So the whole year was actually three quarters. Semester system, you'll have two semesters. It was three quarters. And he went through each one of those twice. And I guarantee when he came out, he knew it better than I did, and I only went through it once. I mean, struggling may not be fun, but it has its benefits. Okay, let's see if I'm missing anything else. I'll leave that to a And these, this is lab stuff. We'll do that later. Okay, now you have your uh, PowerPoints for first chapter, and we'll start. And while I'm doing this, if you think of a question, just blurt it out. Let's see. Let's go here, and here, two oh three there, PowerPoint, and chapter one. I think that's all that I need to cover today. Just check the one. We got an hour to do it. Oh. Yeah, I don't have, uh, and I think I have, oh, we've got lots of time. Three chapters, three periods, followed by review. Well, middle of February before we have our first exam. But you will have some lab grades by then. Okay. Chapter one, basic concepts. Let's start the slideshow. Okay. Everybody see it from way back there? Okay. I'd like to have it bigger, but that's the best we can do with the optics available. So these are the topics that we're going to cover in chapter one. What is chemistry? Usually the, the definition of chemistry is given broad terms. For good reason. I know um, uh, the general chemistry textbook is, is named chemistry, the central science. It's like it. um, we're better than anybody else because we cover everything. But that's not far from the, from the truth. Uh, chemistry began um, really as a uh, cooking exercise. Not cooking to eat, but cooking stuff. You know, the alchemists would cook, hoping to um, either turn lead into gold or discover the uh, elixir of life, something like that. Even Isaac Newton was an alchemist. It was a legitimate uh, 
Well, back then they didn't call them sciences. They called them natural philosophy. <clears throat> but um, over the years, and with the the introduction of of um, uh, quantitative methods and uh, scientific investigation, which we'll come to define in a few minutes, um, we've refined the definition to something like this. Actually, chemistry is the study of substances and their transformations into other substances. How do they change? Okay, first we have to define terms. That's always the way it is. We gotta be speaking the same language, otherwise we can't communicate with any degree of precision. So we define what matter is, right? Well, in its most basic definition, matter is, I mean, it's anything that occupies space and has mass. Okay, so occupy space means volume. Right? So you've got to define what volume is, and you have to define what mass is. Mass is a measure of stuff. It doesn't change no matter where you are in the universe. If you've got so much mass here, you've got the same amount of mass there. Okay? Not like weight, like weight changes. You've often heard, uh, if you weigh 100 pounds, well, let's, let's make it easier, calculation, different. If you weigh, if something weighs 60 pounds on Earth, it'll only weigh 10 pounds on the moon. That's, that's a measure of force because of Newton's law of universal gravitation. But the mass is still the same. I, mean, I didn't change mass from here to there, or the 60 pound object didn't change mass from here to there. So the mass is constant, whereas weight changes. And that begs another question. Why in the lab um, exercises do we say, uh, weigh this substance? Right? It's, a, it's an artifact. When we say weigh, we're actually massing it, making the mass. <clears throat> Uh, this may, may be characteristic of both living and non-living substances. Right? Everything has mass. Um, now, um, the primary differentiation between what is everywhere in the universe is, is it matter or is it energy? Right? It's usually one or the other. When you get down to very, very, very small particles, you know, so it's hard to tell the difference between matter and energy. And you can describe them in terms, you can describe matter in terms of energy, or you can describe energy in terms of matter. That's why we're able to use nuclear energy, because the nuclear reactions convert matter into energy. <clears throat> That's why the atom bombs are so powerful. I mean, you take just a small percentage of the uranium in that uh, in Little Boy, and what do you get? You know, you get a 15 kiloton explosion out of a bomb that's about as long as that table. Or Fat Man, uh, about the same size, only broader, and you get 20 kilotons. Uh, equivalent to TNT. So sometimes the distinction is is um, is difficult to manage between um, energy and matter. <clears throat> but we're not going to we're not going to go there in any depth. Right? Um, we may touch on it, but for the most part, they're separate. So when you when you have uh, matter in a chemical reaction. Uh, of a certain mass, then on the output side, you got the same mass. Right? Such little amount of matter is converted into energy uh, is immeasurable in a chemical reaction. Okay. 
So occasionally we'll have these little checks. Chemistry involves the study of matter. Uh, let's see, which one's right? Matter includes various forms of energy? No, I don't think so. Matter is visible to the naked eye? Yeah. Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space? Yep. So this is a description of matter. It has mass and it has volume. <coughs> Oops. Now, for our purposes, matter is going to come in three forms, three phases, as we say. It's either a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Now, there are other forms of matter in the universe, but the conditions uh, required are very extreme. Like um, in the corona of the sun, right? matter there is none of those. It's called a plasma, which is an ionized gas. But we're not interested in that because it's just beyond the scope of this course. Let's put it that way. So it's going to be either a solid, liquid, or a gas. And then we just need to characterize what those are. Right? So a solid is characterized, uh, it has uh, a definite volume. And it maintains its own shape, right? So a solid doesn't need any help in holding itself together. Right? Anything here, that's a solid. The table's solid. Um, We've got many examples. Now, liquids in your bottles, they're in that bottle for a reason. They have a definite volume, but they don't have a definite shape. So they need help. They assume the shape of the vessel. And then there are gases. They don't have definite shape or definite volume. So within that bottle, if you put a gas in there, if you open the lid, the gas escapes. It tries to fill the volume that's available to it. So, but each one of these when you start out with a certain mass, you end up with the same mass. It might, depending on whether it's a solid, liquid, or gas, it might occupy a different volume in the case of a gas, but they all have the same mass that they started with. So that's constant for your sample. Whatever you start with, you end up with the same mass. It's just depending on what the phase is, um, it might have a definite shape, might have a definite volume, or might have neither in the case of a gas. Oh, examples? All right, that looks like uh, Eisenhower on a quarter. So that's a solid. There's a liquid. I'm not sure what that liquid is. Could be just colored water. Um, this is probably chlorine gas. But the only reason it stays in that beaker is because we've got a lid on it. Okay. Solid liquid gas. So there are other ways to describe uh, the condition of matter. Uh, one is temperature. Right? Is it hot, cold, to the touch? Or is it extremely hot, like getting close to the sun, or from a Bunsen burner, or uh, the eye on your stove? Um, does it exert pressure on its surroundings? Right? Is it a gas confined in a balloon? So it's the only reason the balloon has that shape is the gas is pushing on the inside, making it expand. Let the gas out, the balloon collapses. So that's a, a practical uh, indicator of uh, pressure. Uh, and then we can get down to the nitty gritty. What are the forces that are actually holding that matter together? Right? So the forces that are holding a solid together are pretty strong because they give it a definite volume and a definite shape. 
In other words, to change its shape, you've got to overcome lots of uh, some pretty strong forces to make it change its shape. And sometimes you push on it so hard it might break. Like if I wanted to change, rather than straight, if I wanted this pen to bend, I could bend it a little bit, but eventually I'd break the bonds between these molecules and it would snap. Um, or <clears throat> if you take a solid and heat it up, right, you're adding energy to it and that energy is making the molecules vibrate faster and if you make them vibrate enough, they will break the bonds that are holding the individual molecules together and it becomes a liquid. Right? So you can take, um, I don't know, butter, which is solid, put it in your frying pan, start heating it up, you add more energy to it, you break the bonds that are holding it together as a solid, it becomes a liquid. Okay? Um, and you can, you can keep going uh, and convert a, a liquid, some liquids you can convert into gases before they decompose. Right? It'd be kind of hard to convert uh, butter into a gas, although there are some components of butter. Um, if you heat it up enough, you start to smell them. They, they come off of the butter. You're turning some of them into a gas. So that just means you're adding more energy, you're breaking the bonds, uh, as a liquid, they just sort of slide past one another. But as a gas, they're so far apart, they could care less if there's another gas molecule in the region. Okay, so the physical states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. Now, we need to uh, define what's the difference between Well, let's start off, rather than saying difference, let's just say, what is a property? A property um, is a characteristic of a substance, such as um, color, right? So the color of my shirt is basically red, it's a property of the of substance, or uh, it could be a property, for instance, in a, a safety uh, description for a chemical we're going to use. It might say that the, a property of that chemical is, is caustic. That is, if you get it on your skin, it'll burn. Um, and each substance uh, has a unique set of properties that distinguish it, it distinguishes it from all other substances. Now, they may have, uh, these two substances might have some properties in common, okay, but at least one of them will be different between this substance and that substance. If they were all the same, if you had an infinite number of properties to describe for the two substances, at least one of them would be different for the two substances. Um, we can divide those, uh, like on the previous slide, uh, it could be a physical property or it could be a chemical property. The physical property defines, uh, is a characteristic of the substance. Um, that can, mm, Well, okay. Now we're starting to, to test my ability as a wordsmith. The a physical property um, says nothing about the substance's um, ability to change. I don't know if that's a good way to put it. Let's use examples. Uh, what's the color of the substance? Does it have an odor? Uh, is it solid, liquid, or gas? Um, a physical property was, what temperature does it melt? So, uh, for instance, um, let's see, 
gallium, that element right there. At room temperature, it's a solid. But its melting point is slightly below body temperature. So you put some gallium in your hand and it melts. Um, of course, uh, mercury, at room temperature, it's already a liquid. Right? So its melting point would be uh, below room temperature. If you, if you got it cold enough, it would turn into a solid. So that's a physical property. Uh, boiling point is also, you know, how hard is it? The hardest substance, natural substance in the world is what? Diamond. It used to be uh, 10 point scale. Diamond was a 10. And uh, one is talc. Very soft to very hard. It's a measure of a physical property. Any changes in those physical properties um, does not change the basic identity of the substance. Um, okay, so if we're talking about uh, boiling point, and we're going to boil a liquid and make a gas out of it, like water on the stove, change gas, the water, uh, liquid water into steam, have we changed the basic nature of the molecules? No. We've got water molecules in liquid, water molecules in gas. So that change that occurs based on this physical property does not change the substance. Okay. Um, how do we know? Because all you have to do is take that steam and condense it, get liquid water again, and go backwards and forward. And it all happens at that temperature. Boiling point. Okay. Chemical property. Okay, a chemical property describes um, the way a substance either undergoes change or doesn't undergo, it resists. So it could be, um, uh, the fancy word for that is refractory. It's a refractory substance. It doesn't like to change. Um, so when we have uh, substances that are made out of copper, like uh, uh, copper roofs, you ever seen a copper roof? After when you first put it on, it's, it's shiny, right? That, that shiny, beautiful copper color. It doesn't take long before it gets dull. Now, in the beginning, that dullness is ugly. But over time, it gets what they call a patina. And it looks kind of a greenish color tinge to it. And a combination of the, of the dull and the greenish color is a desirable effect. There was a there's a place on the LSU campus in Baton Rouge called the Coliseum. And it was used primarily for agricultural type activities. Like they have rodeos there. Um, and the, the dome, which was an oblong dome, was covered in copper panels. And apparently the, the rivets or whatever was holding it together, they finally just wasted away. They replaced the roof. And it started off like that, just beautiful copper. But it didn't take long for it to get dull. And by the time I had left, it hadn't been on there long enough to develop that pretty color. Now they have um, um, artificial weathering compounds. You know, if you like the color, um, the contractor will put the roof on and then they'll spray or paint on this stuff and it'll develop that patina quickly. But a lot of the, the older buildings in Europe, especially, uh, that have had these copper roofs on them for a century or more, I don't know how they do it. They fastened them with something that didn't rot out. Um, they have a beautiful color to them. But that is a chemical property. The property of copper to react with air 
is a description of uh, chemical property. It changes from copper to something else. Um, okay. <clears throat> Let's see which one of these is false. Properties of matter are two types, physical and chemical. I think that's true. You can subdivide them into those two. A physical property is a characteristic of matter that can be observed without changing its basic identity. That's true. Chemical property describes the way matter undergoes or exists change to form a new substance. Yeah, that's true. One example of a physical property of water is that it can be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen gas. That's chemical, <laughs> right? Because the hydrogen and oxygen gas are nothing like water. Um, so that's the false one. I forgot about that. Statue of Liberty was covered in copper plates. Right? I used to think when I was a kid, wow, that thing must be really heavy. Well, it is heavy, but it's not as heavy as you would think because it's just a superstructure clad in copper panels. And they've been replaced recently. Okay, chemical or physical property. Iron, metal, rust in the atmosphere of moist air. No idea? Yeah, I bet you do. You just don't want to say. Chemical or physical? Chemical. Oh, yeah. Yeah, chemical. Mercury metal is a liquid at room temperature. Physical, physical yeah. Nickel metal dissolves in acid to produce a light green solution. Mm, that one's trickier. What happens to nickel when it dissolves in acid? What actually happens, and you probably wouldn't know this one, what actually happens is the nickel is broken apart and it's also it's turned into an ion that associates with water molecules and that's what generates the green color okay. so that is a chemical property you're taking the metal which is not ionized and you're stripping electrons off of it that's a chemical reaction so i didn't expect you to get that one okay here we go now as opposed to a property a, uh, a change actually describes what happens. So when we say water boils or water freezes, that's a physical change. The, uh, if we give you the temperature at which that change occurs, that's a physical property. But when the change actually occurs, the description of that change is physical. But water boils, water freezes, physical change. So by, the, by a similar logic, a chemical change describes exactly what is happening. Based on that chemical property, the chemical change for iron in an atmosphere that goes from iron to iron oxide, which is the product of rust, that's a chemical change. When we're describing the actual conversion of one substance into another, we're describing a change, not a property. Okay. Um, sometimes these flow charts help. I right? use them if they help you. So, which describes a chemical change? Pulverizing. Rock salt. Think about what what is it before and what is it after? Is it still salt after? Yeah, it's a physical change. Right. Uh, burning of wood. So you have basically cellulose and lignin in wood. 
and then you throw it in your fireplace, what do you end up with? Ash. <laughs> All the other stuff, like uh, carbon dioxide and water, is going out the chimney. Well, and some partially combusted stuff deposits in the chimney, and over time, that's where you get chimney fires. So you have to have your chimney swept out occasionally. So this is a this is a chemical change. That was physical. This is chemical. What if we dissolve sugar in water? Do we still have sugar in water after it dissolves? How do you know? Evaporate water, right? What do you have left? You have the sugar that you put in there before, right? So it didn't change. So we know that's a, a, a physical change. How about melting a popsicle on a warm summer day? That's physical. It's no good after that happens, but <laughs> this is the only chemical change, burning of wood. Okay, more terminology. Let's start with, well good, we'll start with pure substance. Let's define what a pure substance is. A pure substance is something that uh, cannot be reduced or cannot be separated into any individual components by physical means. Right? For instance, um, well, I come from a, a soil background. My PhD is in uh, soil science. So uh, we used to take soil and we, of course, dry it because wet soil doesn't sift very well. So we, we dry it and then we run it through the various sieves and separate the particle sizes in that soil to characterize it. We were separating that soil by physical means, which means it's not a pure substance. Right? If you can use physical means to separate, it's not pure. <clears throat> but if you take uh, if you take water and um, try to separate it into its components by physical means, water is all you get, no matter what you do to it. Right? The only way you can separate water is by chemical means. You know, shock it. You know, send electricity through it, and then you can produce oxygen, hydrogen, gas. But a pure substance is one which cannot be separated into any simpler uh, substances by physical means. Water, sucrose, that's table sugar, can't be separated. So that, that sugar, for all intents and purposes, the sugar in your bowls <coughs> is a pure substance. Um, distilled water that we use in the lab, that's a pure substance. The water that comes out of your tap is not pure. <laughs> it's got at least chlorine in it, and maybe some other stuff. But some dissolved minerals. Right? You ever tasted uh, distilled water? Ooh, it's horrible. It's no taste at all. That's why when you, when you filter your water through these devices that are either attached to your refrigerator or attached to your faucet. They have, a, a, in addition to activated charcoal that cleans up the nasty stuff, they have a layer of mineral in there. And the water goes through that, dissolves some of that mineral, and that gives it some taste. But it's not pure then. It's got all the other dissolved stuff in it. So a mixture is a physical combination of pure substances. Two or more will give you a mixture. And that mixture can be separated by physical means. So for my soils, all I have to do is run it through sieves and separate particles. Um, if it's a mixture of water and sucrose, sugar water, you know, that you put out in your feeder for the uh, hummingbirds, that's a mixture, 
<clears throat> because you can separate it by physical means. All you have to do is evaporate the water and you've got the sugar left. If you capture the, the vapor and condense it, you can get the water also. Water and sugar separated. And we're, one of our lab experiments is going to do uh, just a physical separation like that. Uh, but each substance retains its own chemical identity. There are separate substances mixed together. Um, okay, so these mixtures can be classified further as either homogeneous or heterogeneous. Okay. The homogeneous ones are the ones that can be sampled anywhere and the same percentage composition of your components will, will be shown any place you look. They're uniform distribution of each of the substances in that mixture. So salt water would be example. Any place you check it, it's going to have the same percentage salt or sugar water, same percentage sugar. Whereas a heterogeneous mixture, you won't get the same composition wherever you sample. It's like a jar of jelly beans. Right? Take a handful of jelly beans and count the different colors. You're going to have a different composition if you stick your hand in there again and pull it out and count those. They're going to be different. And go back to my soils. Soils are heterogeneous. Right? If you've ever dug a ditch or a hole in the ground, um, you can see the, the texture of your soil change with depth. Until you get down to bedrock, which in many places in West Virginia, you don't have to go very far. <clears throat> but those are heterogeneous mixtures. They're non-uniformly distributed. Okay, so we can subdivide. Uh, we started talking about matter. Now we have pure substance, right? Only one substance is, is accounted for, like pure water or um, uh, 24 karat gold is pure gold, 100%. Um, this is uh, 14 karat, so it's not pure. Right? It's an alloy. It's a mixture of gold and something else, some other base metal, silver, copper, usually. Um, so my ring is actually a mixture. So what kind of mixture is it? Is it homogeneous or heterogeneous? Well, there's some argument there, but for our purposes, it's homogeneous. I'll take a sample of it, scratch off a little bit, have it analyzed. It'll have the same amount of gold, no matter how many samples you take. Okay. Oops. <laughs> Went too far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wonder what the answer to this one could be. Homogeneous mixture. Um, okay, this... Um, how do you answer questions? I mean, uh, test taking techniques. You know, look at the question. Sometimes it's more valuable to work backwards in a question, right? Mixture, right? Which ones are mixtures? Not that one. Okay, that's a mixture. That's a mixture. That's a mixture. That's not a mixture. So you eliminate A and E right off the bat. Then you work your way back up. Okay, of those mixtures that you identified, which ones are homogeneous? Well, soils, I told you soil's not. It's, it's hetero. Uh, jelly beans, they're not uniform, right? So the only one left by process of elimination is gasoline. Gasoline is a mixture primarily of um, octane, which is a hydrocarbon, and then other things, uh, usually volatile components that are mixed in there, to adjust its uh, octane rating, right? If you pump your own gas, you see, okay, you've got 87 octane, that's the cheaper one. And you got 92 or 93 octane, that's the more expensive one. Back in my youth, used to be able to get uh, uh, 100 or better octane. That's what you need for high performance engines. So if you, if you fancy um, uh, buying some um, expensive Italian sports car, like to get rich, 
future. Just remember, in addition to the maintenance that's sky high, thousand dollars a visit, the gasoline is going to be more expensive too, because you got to use high octane. But they accomplish that by additives. So you mix in things with with uh, with your octane, and you get different, and it changes um, with the seasons, right? In the in the colder weather, they're going to put um, more volatile compounds in there because they don't vaporize as fast at low temperature. In the summer, they'll put less of the volatile compounds because they don't want it to all blow off. But the, the idea is to adjust the, um, the rate of conversion of the gasoline into a vapor in your engine. <coughs> um, to stabilize the performance. And then of course you've got these other additives that are supposed to clean your carburetors or clean your injectors. Some of them are valid, some of them just marketing points. Okay, which of these uh, examples only have pure substances? Right. So this is a fairly simple question. We just have to look for pure, right? Which one has pure? Oxygen's pure, tap water is not pure, tea is not pure. Tea is an infusion. Right? You take your tea bag, you put it in water, and the stuff just kind of dissolves. It doesn't really dissolve. It's separated. Some some components of tea do dissolve in water, and some are just so, so small particle sizes that they're uh, distributed, uh, suspended. So it's not that one. Oxygen, glucose is a pure substance. Silver is a pure substance. So test taking technique. If there are no choices down here for all of the above, none of the above, two of the above, that type of thing, once you find the right answer, you're done. You don't have to waste time looking at the others. Right? So we know that that one is all pure substances. That's why it's important for you to know the material, not just how to answer the test, have questions uh, or, or uh, process of elimination, which works sometimes. But if, if you actually know what you're talking about, then you can work your way down, found the right answer, that was done. Okay, what's an element? <coughs> an element. First of all, it's a pure substance. If you have an element in your hand, aside from your hand, what's in it is a pure substance. There's nothing else there but that material, that substance. And it's it's not characterized, it's not a mixture. Um, there are only atoms of that element. And it cannot be broken down into simpler pure substances. By chemical means, right? You can't heat it up. You can't shine light on it. You can't shock it with electricity. Nothing will make it simpler. That's as simple as you can go. Um, examples: gold, silver, and copper. Right? So there's uh, gold, there's silver, and there's copper. Um, we're only saying what it is. We're not saying how much it is. So if you can, you can have element, and you can have a mass of that element, and then you could have the same element over here, more mass. In the case of gold, that's good. In the case of silver, that's good. Well, actually, pure copper is expensive too. <clears throat> so we're not saying we're only saying what. We're not saying how much. So when you say element, you're saying nothing about how much there is there, just what it is. And each element has a different, uh, has different physical and chemical properties. Right? They're unique for each element. So what's a compound? Well, once you have an element, if you combine that element 
with another element, chemically speaking, then you can produce a compound. For instance, water. Right? If you combine uh, oxygen and hydrogen, you can make water. Now, these are details that we'll go over later. And let's see. Two, two. That's a chemical equation, and we'll we'll dig into that deeper later. But this is a compound of these two elements. These are the elements. That's the compound. You have to have at least two different elements to make a compound. You can have more than two. Some compounds have many more than two, especially those organic compounds in your body that make things work. Um, you're going to have at least carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Sometimes sulfur, sometimes some other elements. But those compounds have to have at least two elements. Right? <clears throat> so, um, this is a compound, these are elements, but these elements, these two elements, are actually two atoms put together, but they're the same atom, so it's still an element. So, we got pure substances. If we combine two or more of those pure substances, we get a compound. We only have one, we have an element. Now, the, the difference, uh, if we have a, a hydrogen and oxygen combined together in a compound, it has different properties, chemical and physical properties, from these elements, right? These are both gases at room temperature, and at room temperature, water's a liquid. Right? So there's one physical property. Plus, water's non-reactive. Right? But hydrogen and oxygen are reactive. Otherwise, you wouldn't get this. Now, if you have oxygen and hydrogen together in a balloon, or in a, a closed space, they're both gases, but they're mixed together. They haven't reacted yet. Right? So that's a, a homogeneous mixture. Right? Whenever you put two or more gases together, you always get a homogeneous mixture, every time. Gases never segregate. Why? Because there's plenty of room for everybody. Space between the molecules is gargantuan compared to the size of the molecule. So they're happy to just put as many gases in there as you want. You always get a homogeneous mixture. But mixing these two together uh, gives you that homogeneous mixture. But all you have to do is just either heat them up a little bit or put a little spark in there and they react and produce water. Anybody old enough to remember the space shuttle? Everybody remembers the space shuttle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can go back and look at archive footage. You'll see the this looks like a space uh, plane on its tail, standing up here on its tail. It's got these two big rockets sitting on the outside. And then in between those rockets is a huge orange tank. <laughs> that tank is, is orange because it's painted orange, <laughs> but it's covered with insulation. And it's covered with insulation because inside is liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen in two separate tanks. And those two are brought together from that tank into the main engines, mixed together, and they're burned, produce massive amounts of energy. And that, in addition to the solid rockets on the outside, send it into space. But that chemical reaction is, is just this right here. You just 
oxygen and hydrogen together, make water. Plus, <laughs> well, let's see, I'm off the board now. Plus, energy. And lots of it. Okay. One thing about compounds is um, if you identify a compound, and a compound can be a pure substance, right? You can't separate water as long as it's just water. You can't separate the parts of water by physical means. So water with nothing else is a pure substance. Compounds can be pure substances. Elements can be pure substances. But the, the interesting thing is, the compound water, if you identify this as water, no matter where it comes from, whether you um, distill it from seawater, or you produce it in a container by reacting oxygen and hydrogen together, you don't know where it came from, unless you actually did the experiment. If somebody gives you water from one source or another, you don't know which one it came from because water is always the same composition every time, no matter where it came from. It's always 11.2% hydrogen and 88.8% oxygen by mass. Okay. So out of 100 grams of water, you're going to have 11.2 grams of hydrogen. Okay. That's what that means. Percent means parts per 100. So if you have 100 grams, 11.2 grams is hydrogen. Okay, so here's another flow chart <coughs> for a classifying matter. You can look at that at your leisure. Oops. Um, okay, so if we have a sample of matter, characterizing it, you want to ask yourself some questions. Does the sample have the same properties throughout? Test it for physical and chemical properties. They have the same properties throughout. Are two or more of the substances, different substances present? You may have a mixture. If you can separate them physically, then you could get pure substances out of them. And then you ask yourself, does the pure substances, can the pure substance be broken down? into simpler substances. So if you separate those substances, like sugar water, you separate the water from the sugar, right, by physical means, so you know you have a mixture there. You know it's homogeneous because you sampled it several places, you always get the same composition. Then you take those separated substances, pure substances, because you can't separate them any further by physical means, and you try some chemistry on them, right? You, you take the water and you stick it in a device that has two electrodes, one positive, one negative, and the, the negative one produces hydrogen and the positive one produces oxygen. And you can test uh, the gases to see what they are. Uh, you take the sugar, and this is a little trickier, uh, to separate its <laughs> components. But for analytical purposes, you could react it with oxygen and collect the carbon dioxide water and back calculate. I think we get to do some of that later on. What's the difference between an element and a compound? Well, let's see, an element is a pure substance, whereas a compound is not. <laughs> Compounds can be pure substances also. So the first one's false. Um, an element can be broken into simpler constituents. Wrong. You can't make an element any simpler than it is. Not by chemical means. Now, if you've got a nuclear reactor, you know, you can transmute elements into other substances. That's how breeder reactors work. You have uranium, impure uranium, and uh, the U-235, 
uh, is the one that splits and makes the energy, but the U-238 converts into plutonium. And all you have to do is just carefully extract the plutonium and you can take that and put it in a different reactor. So A and B are both uh, false. The difference between an element and a compound, an element can be broken down into a set. No, they got it wrong again. An element cannot be broken down into simpler substance. That's true by chemical means. Whereas a compound can. That's true. That's a fact, Jack. Okay. So, how many elements are there? Well, when this slide was made, there were 118 elements. Well, actually, there are 118 elements. Right? The very last one is right here, 118. Um, in the past few years, they've all been given names. They used to have uh, uh, systematic substitutions for names. Right? We won't go into that. It's kind of stupid the way they did it. But now they all have actual names that are accepted by the scientific community. And most of them honor people or places. Might, they might honor the place where it was discovered or the person or persons in some form or fashion who were responsible for isolating the element, characterizing it. So we had to add these down here because those were empty. Now, when you fill out that uh, extra credit table, um, there are places for everything in there, right? So you might have to go somewhere. You may not find these in some periodic tables, but they're out there. So you could you could surf the, the internet and find them. Find the characteristics for each. So it's going to take a little work. Right? But that's what extra credit's for. Okay. What am I running up against the deadline here? I hope I can finish this. We don't have uh, a lab exercise to do today. We just have some safety stuff. So we can we can run over. Now, if you have to take a break, right, just but do, do your business. You know, you won't hurt my feelings. And if enough of you leave, we'll we'll pause for a moment. Um, so 118 elements. Um, 88 or so occur naturally. That is, you can isolate them in nature. They can be found already existing. And about 30 of them um, are synthesized. They're, they're man-made, artificial. The interesting thing is, some of those that were originally uh, created in the laboratory have since been found in nature. Because over time, our analytical techniques become more refined, able to identify smaller quantities, and some of these have been found in nature. Okay, in the universe, the number of atoms of each of the elements, right? Not the mass, but the numbers of atoms. As the universe is largely made up of hydrogen. And where is most of that hydrogen found? In stars. Uh, there's a good bit of helium also. Right? And then the rest of them are less than 0.1%. So we still got lots of fuel, nuclear fuel out there. Um, in fact, helium, uh, helium comes from the word for sun. And it was discovered in the sun first, before it was discovered on Earth. It was discovered spectroscopically in the atmosphere of the sun before it was identified on Earth. Now, where do we have a lot of helium? Right, helium is pretty light, right? So it's, it's kind of rare in the atmosphere. It floats to the top and it's gone in space. But it's constantly being replenished coming out of the ground, kind of like radon gas that comes out of the ground, inhabits your basement. 
but helium is more concentrated in one source than others, and that's natural gas. It makes sense. I mean, it's, it keeps coming up from down below. It gets trapped in these spaces, and natural gas is a good place for it to, to stop off. So the federal government, it used to be, back in the, the first parts of the uh, 20th century, 1900s, on, um, the federal government identified helium as a strategic element. That is, it had to be protected and kept from our enemies because it was used in balloons, right? That was before heavier than air aircraft were common. Balloons were more common. We used helium in those. So the government would, um, the uh, petroleum industry, in their cleanup process, would remove the helium, and the federal government would take that helium and store it in underground caverns. You know, we'd go in, uh, mine out uh, a salt dome, hydraulically mine it out, and then we'd use that space to store the helium. Um, and that was one of the reasons that um, Germany, during World War I, was, uh, had to use hydrogen in their zeppelins, their balloons. Because we said, uh -uh, you can't have helium. And the United States basically had the market cornered on helium. So they used hydrogen in their zeppelins, and eventually, you know, something sparked and one blew up. Actually burned, the Hindenburg. And that basically, killed the Zeppelin industry. <laughs> Nobody wanted to fly in them anymore. <clears throat> anyway, so most of the universe is, uh, by atom, is largely hydrogen. Now, if we look at um, the abundance of elements in the Earth's crust, we find that we shift over to other elements, and hydrogen is a significant component Right. But most of what's uh, in the Earth's crust is oxygen. Most elements in the Earth's crust are oxides of the elements. Like iron ore is uh, basically iron oxide. So when you smelt it, you separate the oxygen out and you keep the iron. Uh, aluminum oxide is bauxite ore. That's the source. And you extract the aluminum and throw away the oxygen. Another major element is silicon. Right? So everybody likes to walk on the beach. Right? You got silicon dioxide through your toes the whole time, or in your blankets, or, or in your bathing suit, or <laughs> up your nose, or wherever you don't want it. <laughs> That's silicon dioxide. So, uh, the most common element in the Earth's crust is oxygen. And it's even more common if you consider the oceans. If you add the oceans in there, the percentage goes up even higher. Because the oceans are uh, hydrogen dioxide, no, dihydrogen oxide, water. If our planet's mostly covered in water, how do we not have more hydrogen on that little chart? Does this just not count in bonds of like water and stuff? It's just the oh, sun. no, because it's Earth's crust. Oh, Earth's crust, yeah. I yeah, I forgot about that part of it. Yeah, it would be bigger, yeah, a lot bigger if we included the oceans. Uh, there may be another diagram in your text that, that incorporates it that way. And this is atom percent, this is number of atoms. So if we go by mass, this would shrink because hydrogen doesn't weigh very much. And there I go again. I'm saying weighing, using that as a substitute for mass. So forgive me, that's old school. Okay, which two elements dominate the Earth's crust? And which dominates the universe? Okay, which two elements? Okay, the universe is dominated by hydrogen, right? So we can say this one or this one, throw that one out, throw that one out. So then we have to go in here and say, Earth's crust, we look for oxygen and silicon. Those were the two major ones in the crust.
chemical symbols. Okay. Now we're getting down to stuff that you have to memorize. You'll notice on the periodic table, elements are either one or two letters in their name, in their symbols. Right. Hydrogen only has one. Any other one that wants to use H can't use it anymore. So then we have to add a second. So the first letter is always capitalized, and if it needs a second letter, it's always a small one. Right. So helium uses H, but we have to add a little E for helium. Okay. And most of them um, can be visualized as deriving from the English word. <clears throat> but some of them are not derived from English. Those are probably the ones that are going to give you trouble in the beginning. Um, so we've got this one, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, iodine, sulfur, phosphorus. Those are all single letters. And then if you have to add, if you need to use that first letter again, you have to add a second one to distinguish them from one from the other. Now this, this whole um, scheme of identifying elements by the, these letters um, wasn't just a given. I mean, it, it wasn't intuitive, right? When a large enough collection of elements had been identified and we needed a system, uh, a shorthand system to identify, to uh, write them, right? Rather than writing up a whole name for everything, right? So imagine if I had to write, uh, Hydrogen plus oxygen yields water. That, that would be unwieldy. So various systems were proposed, and some of them were just ridiculous. Fortunately, this system was chosen. It was developed by a scientist, uh, I think it was Swedish, a scientist named Berzelius. And he came up with this idea. You know, just use the letters. You know, Keep it simple, stupid. <clears throat> so he went out, and then now you have uh, some of them that, like boron, you can, that's obvious, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, aluminum, silicon, those are obvious, phosphorus, actually pH for the sound, okay. S for sulfur, um, argon, krypton, xenon. So these, these are all fairly obvious. But some of them you get to, like Na, that's sodium. You know, where, how do you get Na from sodium? You don't. Know, you get it from the Latin, natrum. Natrum is Latin for sodium, so Na is for sodium. Uh, K for potassium, right? You can't, there's no K in potassium, but there is in kalium, which is Latin for potassium. And so several of them are like that. Um, iron, Fe for ferrum. Okay. Um, these precious metals, Cu, that's sort of like copper, but there's no U in copper. It's cuprum, Latin. Uh, silver, argentum, Ag, out of argentum. And gold, aurum, Au. So some of them are like that. And the ones you need to know, of course, are outlined in, in the red boxes with the, with the pink tint. And that's about half of them, half of the chart. So uh, what would I say, 118. So there are probably uh, 59 or roughly that many that you need to memorize. Now, if you've got a method for memorizing stuff, go with it. Right. If you don't, one good way is to make yourself flashcards. Just get three by fives, write the symbol on one side, the name on the other. And that process of making those flashcards is a memorization exercise to begin with. Right? You get your first exposure from making the cards, and then you flip through them and uh, test yourself. And when you're satisfied with one, you can set it aside and go back and just keep drilling the ones that you're weak on until you got them all. I think there are apps or uh, uh, websites uh, that will test you as well. And in fact, I may have put a link. 
I think I put a link in Blackboard to one of those sites. Okay. So, uh, chemical symbols consist of one or two letters derived from the element's name. I don't want to run too far over. Okay. Now, everything, everything is composed of elements. Right? If it's only one element, it's a pure substance. If it's two or more elements combined together, right? If they're just mixed together and you can separate them physically, of course, it's just a mixture. But if they're combined together and you can't get them apart except by chemical means, then it's a compound. But each one of those uh, elements, if you keep dividing it, like you take your sample and you cut it, take that one and cut it, and you keep cutting it physically speaking, you'll eventually get to the point where you've only got two of them, cut them, and you got one each. Okay, that one is an atom, an atom of that element. Right. So the element can be physically divided down to one simple particle, smallest particle of an element. Still has the properties of that element. Um, and they're very small, extremely small. Can't see them with the unaided eye. Some of them have been visualized by instrumentation. You know, a electron microscope can do some. Uh, the atomic force microscope uh, can do some. Now, um, some of those elements under standard conditions, and by standard conditions, we mean one atmosphere pressure, and depending on whether it's a gas or, or something else, it's either zero degrees centigrade or 25 degrees centigrade. All gases, standard conditions are zero degrees. So if we have a gas and there are two atoms combined together in a molecule, it's not a compound, but it is a molecule because it's not just one element. Right? So that can mess with your head. <laughs> so think on it, study on it a while, answer lots of questions using those terms get a firm grip on uh, what a molecule is, two or more atoms that function as a single unit is a molecule. So that means that water, an individual, H, two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen bound together is a molecule of water and it's a compound. But two atoms of hydrogen bound together is still an element but it's a molecule, okay? Um, and I've identified on that, um, yeah, that periodic table with the red boxes and everything, highlighted in blue, those elements that under standard room temperature and pressure conditions exist as diatomic molecules. There's just a few of them, right? Hydrogen's one, then nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iron. Those. There. Form that upside down L. Upside down and backwards. That's L. Plus hydrogen. Those are your only diatomics. The reason I emphasize those is <clears throat> if you're given a word problem where it's just the name of the element, you're reacting this element with something else, and you see that element name is one of these elements, you know that when you write out the, the reaction, you better write it as a diatomic. Otherwise, it won't work. Okay. So you need to, to know those diatomics also. Um, triatomic is, is rare. But the reason we put that in there is just to show that di means two, 
and tri means three. That's it. Three atoms, two atoms. You could say uh, octatomic for eight. I think sulfur exists in some of its forms as eight sulfur atoms bound together. Not always, but sometimes. Now, if the molecule is homoatomic, that means it's only got one element. Right. Homoatomic means the chlorine, of course, is diatomic. Uh, this form of phosphorus has four phosphorus, and this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sulfur is eight in those molecules. Okay? So this would be tetra. Tetraatomic, but they're all homoatomic because they've only got one type of atom in the molecule. And of course, heteroatomic molecules have two or more different kinds. Water molecules, perfect example. Um, glucose floats around in your blood. Right? If you're diabetic, you get too much of it. It's composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. And it's a heteroatomic molecule. Okay, um, so this is a this is a diatomic heteroatomic molecule. It's got two different types of atoms, which makes it uh, well. This is diatomic, but it's hetero because they're different. Right? This one's tetraatomic, but it's also um, let's see, tetraatomic, but it's heteroatomic. These are all heteros. Okay, so let's take this example, XeF4. What is that? Okay, that, that's kind of, that's not fair. Because this is describing a compound and we haven't told you how to build compound yet, have we? <laughs> okay, <clears throat> this means that that molecule has one xenon atom combined with four fluorine atoms. Okay, so the subscript means that's how many of them you have. Okay. So this one is what? One plus four is five. So that means it's pentaatomic. You know the prefixes? Right? Mono, di, tri, tetra. I think this is in your book. Uh, tetra, penta for five. Uh, hexa for six. Hepta for seven. Uh, octa for eight. Nona for nine. And deca. Oops. Deca for ten. Right. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 10. Those are the prefixes, uh, the Greek prefixes for how many. So this would be uh, pentaatomic. Right. Is it homo or hetero? It's, yeah, hetero. It's got two different types of, of atoms there. Okay. Is it an element or a compound? Compound. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, the smallest particle of an element that can exist and still have properties of the element is called an atom. That is true. A group of two or more atoms that function as a unit form a molecule. Uh, that's true. Some classifications of molecules are diatomic, homotomic. That's true. So it's all of these. They're all true. Okay. Oh, good. We are going to get the formulas. <laughs> so when you combine these uh, element symbols together, <coughs> and you're implying by putting them together that they behave as a single unit, you're saying this is the molecule. This is the, the formula of the molecule. Then there are certain conventions. 
the subscript tells you how many of the preceding is part of that molecule. So for water, it's two hydrogens and one oxygen. We never write one, right? Because if the symbol's there, there's at least one of them, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. Right? So we don't, we're not redundant to that. But if there are two of them, you have that. Now, sometimes you have parts of a formula that behave as a single unit within the molecule, right? These are called polyatomic. So this polyatomic, we can't break it apart, but we need two of them. Right? So in that case, you have to put parentheses around it. And then another subscript saying you have two of those. And then of course, calcium, you need three of them. So then you ask yourself, if I count up how many of each atom there is, how do I do that? Well, this one's obvious. There are three calciums. But for this one, there are two of that group, so that means there are two phosphorus. And there are eight oxygen, because there are four in the group, but you have two groups, so there are eight oxygens. Okay? That's the way you read that formula if you need to know how many of each atom there are. How many atoms of each are there here? Okay, this one's fairly easy. Two hydrogens, one sulfur, and four oxygens, right? <coughs> How about this one? Fe is iron, right? two iron, three carbons, and nine oxygens. Okay? Um, let's see. Let's skip that. Oh, we're at the end. So we have these concept questions. We could, we could beat this dead horse, but I'm going to let you deal with it yourself on your own. All right, so that's chapter one. Uh, let's see. I forgot to give you anything that might be useful. Yeah, I might give you this one. Oh, um, I already asked you before that some of you that have algebra, right? Um, is that the prerequisite for NLP algebra? Okay. Okay. So if you're not going into NLT, what what kind of math do they teach? Is it like the arithmetic, something like that, or does it matter? Does everybody have algebra, or are you in algebra now? I think everybody Okay. Okay. Um, the only reason I say that is. I've got a little quiz here that I sometimes I give my class, especially if if I, I encounter a class that hasn't had algebra or, or maybe you haven't had math in several years, you know. And this little quiz is something you can do to see where you're weak. Right? If you can if you can work this quiz, uh, then you've got all the math skills you need. You don't have to take it. I mean, it's not graded. I mean, unless you just really want to. <laughs> and most of my classes, if they don't have to, they don't want to. Um, so if, if you feel weak in math, let me know, and I'll give you a copy, and you can test yourself. Uh, let's take a break. No. And um, let's see. Let's come back in here first, and I'll give you some handouts, and then, then we'll go down to the, the lab. Yeah, I better stop this recording. Uh...